to have a great time together. We're in our new schedule, and it's affecting us, I can tell. <laughs> it's good. I want to encourage you. Um, you are welcome to move on in this way if you'd like. You don't have to, but you could. Just a suggestion. All right. You can go ahead and take a seat, though, and we are going to take our offering this morning. The first thing we like to do around here this morning is give back to God. Would you pray with me? Lord, you're so good to us. Thank you for giving us a place to come and to be surrounded by our brothers and sisters and to lift your name on high and to worship you and to work in our own faith in our hearts to grow it and dig deeper in your word. And we're just so thankful. And thank you for providing for us our every need. You take such faithful care of us and even more. Your blessings abound. We praise you, Father, for that. And we, as an act of worship, Lord, give back. So would you be honored by our tithes and offerings this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. All right, as our offering is received, let's take a minute to see what's happening around here at the chapel. Good morning, church. I'm Rhonda Clausen, the Women's Ministry Director, and I'm so glad you're here to worship and receive from God's Word today. Before we continue in worship, let's talk about what's going on at Camino Chapel. Save the date. July 30th, we will be having our fifth Sunday family service. We will have one combined service at 10 a.m. and then join together for a wonderful time of fellowship and a delicious picnic lunch outdoors provided by Camino Chapel. We'll be having baptisms at this service as well. So if you or someone you know are interested, get signed up at our Connect Corner. Some of you may have noticed that we posted the first episode of a new podcast on YouTube last week. Well, this week, we are excited to officially launch Pulpit to Podcast. This is a show where Pastor Jeff Turner and Bo Steele explore the intersection of faith, personal growth, and everyday life by diving deeper into Sunday's sermon. This will be available as a video podcast on YouTube or you can listen to the audio version on your favorite podcast app. It is also available on our website under the media tab. So be sure to check out our very first episode and join in every Tuesday for the latest from pulpit to podcast. Hey, middle school and high school students, are you signed up for camp yet? Our team is gearing up for a great time at both camps this year. We would love for you to join in on the fun, so be sure to get signed up. For the whole church body, we have a great way for you to help support sending kids to camp. Fireworks! Starting June 19th, come buy your fireworks this year at the fireworks stands at both the Camino IGA and the Stanwood QFC parking lots. All proceeds go towards these camps. We also need help selling the fireworks. If you can give a few hours to help out, please sign up today on our Connect page and come join the fun. Hey, if you're new with us or if you're looking to get connected, be sure to fill out a Connect card online or at the Connect corner in the foyer. And to find details about everything we have going on here at the chapel, visit kamenochapel.org slash connect. Uh, if I know that I'm going to do this, I drink extra coffee. <laughs> Let's be honest. So do we, don't we? I do. I drink extra coffee on Sunday morning. And I bet you do too once you get here because our coffee's good and the fellowship is sweet. And we're glad to have you with us. And there will be coffee after the service. Don't worry. All right. Would you stand to your feet? Find someone near you to say good morning to. Good morning.
and I read this week that the answer, the only answer, the complete answer to the sin and the darkness and the brokenness that we see is Jesus and his resurrection. Because the grave is still empty. Jesus did rise from the dead and he is alive and active. And because of that, Christian, follower of Christ, you have all the hope in the world because he defeated death, he defeated sin, the grave is empty, our resurrected Jesus is the answer to all of it. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Amen. And we gotta remind ourselves and each other of that because sometimes things get a little heavy and we get a little caught up in, oh my goodness, how is this ever gonna get fixed? Jesus. Jesus. Amen.
to head off to Kids Church. We're sorry to have you leave us, but you get to go have a really good time. If you're visiting or kind of new to us, they are welcome to go. Just walk them on over, follow, you can hear them. They're gonna have a great time and they know it. <laughs> go join the fun. We'll sing one more song together.
Lord God, I pray that you would be the vision of our lives. Those of us who are living this life and it oftentimes feels like on this journey we have no idea where we're headed. The too often we also decide that we're going to take initiative on our own even though it be against your will. But Lord God, I pray that as the Christ follower would be that we would humbly seek to know your will and to walk with you in this life. So Jesus, I pray you'd lead us. Lead us in your word as we are going to open up in Nehemiah today. Holy Spirit, we, we pray that you would illuminate our eyes, our heart, our mind to know your word, to know your will, to walk humbly, to walk in obedience, and to enjoy you. So, Lord God, that's my prayer, that we would enjoy you, to love you, to walk steadfast with you as you guide us throughout our life. Holy Spirit, please speak to us. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Awesome. Hey, you can have a seat. How are we doing, Commando Chapel? Yeah, we enjoying the summertime a little bit? Feel like summertime. What the heck, man? It's like 56 degrees, Actually, I kind of love it. Like, don't get here too quick, son. Man, we, uh, I still need a little bit of the cool. Get your Bibles out. Let's go to the book of Nehemiah. If you are new with us and uh, you missed last week, we started a new series um, after we had been in 1 John through the springtime. We're now entering into our summer series, book of Nehemiah. If you've never read that book before, that's okay. Um, I, I tell people all the time, find the table of contents. Go find Nehemiah. And we're going to be in chapter 2. So as you are uh, looking up chapter 2, let me give you a couple things. One, you probably heard in our announcements about this new podcast we started. And we're just having a lot of fun with it. Uh, some, sometimes we're going to be talking about the sermon that we just talked about on that Sunday. Sometimes we're just going to go off the rails and just talk about who knows what. So anyways, I hope you'll find it on YouTube or Spotify. Go to our website and get a chance to look at that. Okay. Now, second thing. Um, I never have a joke at the first of my sermon, and I wanted to see if you guys wanted to hear a joke. Would that be all right? You guys want to hear a joke? I think it's funny, so you better laugh at it. You can't not laugh at it. Okay. So Mitch Mitchell sent me this joke this week, and I thought, okay, man, I'm going to use it. So there's a, there's a husband, and a wife, and a mother-in-law, and they go to Jerusalem for a trip, and the mother-in-law dies. So the undertaker is talking to the father and the wife and says, you know, with your mother-in-law passing away, if you were to ship her back to the United States, it would cost about five to $6,000. But if you want a barrier here in the Holy Land, it'll only be $150. And the husband just thought about it and he said, you know, I think we're going to ship her back to the United States. And the undertaker said, why on earth would you spend $6,000 shipping her back to the United States when you could bury her here in Jerusalem for 150 bucks. And he said, well, there was a man about 2,000 years ago that died, was buried, and rose again on the third day. And I just can't take that kind of chance. Yeah, isn't that awesome? Oh, that was funny. So all you mother-in-laws that did not laugh, we love you. <laughs> I thought it was funny. All right. Let's get our Bibles out. Go to Nehemiah chapter 2. Um, Nehemiah, I, I said this in the podcast. I said this last Sunday. This has the potential to really do a work on us at Commando Chapel in regards to our culture, who we are, individually, corporately. Because what we're going to see throughout this book is the covenant-keeping God of the universe who loves his people and works with a man and the people that are going to work with Nehemiah to accomplish this big, hairy, audacious goal and dream to see God restore and rebuild the wall in Jerusalem. Now, go to chapter 2 of Nehemiah. And I want you to go to the, the, the sentence just before chapter 2, 
Nehemiah says, now I was cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 1, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence. So stop here just for a moment before we talk about his emotion he's talking about. I just want to give you a little bit of context, especially if you've never read the book of Nehemiah or you've never heard of what this thing called a cupbearer is. So Nehemiah is describing what his role was next to the king. Some of us have no idea what this means to be the cupbearer, but this wasn't just some ordinary person that brought out the food. They had a very intimate relationship with the king in which at each meal, whether that's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, snacks, whatever, Nehemiah would have been right there with the king. And he had the privilege of being the person that at each one of those meals to make sure that the food and the drink wasn't poisoned. So imagine this, go just a little bit deeper. They would actually be in the kitchen watching the staff to make sure every step in preparation of the king's food wasn't messed with, wasn't tainted. So here's Nehemiah, and he's watching the food and the chefs and the servants, and they're going around, and at any moment, someone with a little bit of a bad disposition or a bad agenda who wanted to assassinate the king could pull a little and just rot in the drink. Because we're not talking about some any old kingdom. This is the Persian Empire. And they were good at making enemies. And they were good at taking over land. And it would be nothing for a little coup, a little organization take place in which they get with the chefs and the workers to say, tonight's the night, we're going to end the king's life right in the drink or in the food. So here's what Nehemiah had to do. He had to watch them. He was the guy watching the food preparation take place. And then he had to take that food and take it to the king and in front of him drink the wine and eat some of the food. See, he couldn't do that back in the kitchen and just bring it out and say, okay, everything's taken care of. What if he was a part of it? So he had to bring the food out. The king would look at him however I, how, can you imagine how he looks at him and goes, okay, you know, do your thing. And there's, you know, sip the wine, eat some of the whatever, everything's fine. And at that point, the king knew, okay, I can eat. That was a very intimate relationship. One of which he is there all the time. And you think about this, if you're the cupbearer with the king all the time, you're at every meal, you're at every snacky snack, you're probably with him when he's having delegates from other countries. He gets to be part of conversations he's not supposed to be a part of, so to speak. He's hearing details he doesn't need to hear. This is a very intimate relationship that Nehemiah has with this king. Now here's a second piece to this. Nehemiah has developed a very intimate relationship with the king and serving someone that probably Nehemiah doesn't really like. And here's why. The Persian kingdom took over the Babylonians after the exile. They helped get the temple restored, but they've also had their hand in some messy stuff as well. Before Artaxerxes was King Xerxes, who radically stole as many young virgins as possible from the Jews and Persians to be in his harem, to have his way with them, going back to the book of Esther. So you imagine there's families that were stolen, taken away. So there's good and bad that have happened with the Persian Empire. Nehemiah has to serve someone that really rides the fence in this disposition. Now, here's what makes me think. Throughout today are going to be several little sermons. I mean, we're going to hit a bunch of random points. And you're going to go, where is this headed? Good question. So here's the first one. Nehemiah gives the model example of somebody willing to serve somebody that they ardently disagree with. My question to you as a Christ follower, are you willing to serve somebody even if you disagree with them? 
<laughs> now this is church. Everyone's like, yes, I would. <laughs> Brother, I just love my enemy. Let's, let's take this a step forward. You're a Republican in this room, and you get the opportunity to serve Joe Biden. How are you serving Joe Biden? You're the Democrat in the room, and we ask you, you're going to serve Donald Trump. Now, I hear it. It's kind of funny. It was like, oh, my God. But Nehemiah shows us the example of somebody that would look at Artaxerxes and go, your great granddaddy or however far up the chain is on the king, you stole my great aunt to be in your palace. And I'm not going to use language. who has got little ears sometimes to do with that person as you wish. And I'm now having to serve you. It goes beyond just ide ideology. It is now you're the great grandson of the one that stole my great aunt and did your way with her. And I am going to serve you. And we can joke all day long of what it looks like to serve the other political party. But the reality is we see not only Nehemiah serve those who are the enemy to him. You and I see our Savior Jesus serving all of mankind that has nothing to do with Jesus. Who spat at Jesus in his face, threw rocks at him to stone him, nailed him to the cross. And Jesus says on the cross, Father, what does he say? Forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And so we can sit back and kind of laugh about serving someone we don't like, Joe Biden or Donald Trump or whatever that is. But Nehemiah and Jesus himself shows us the example of what it means to actually love our enemy. That's hard, isn't it? That's not easy. But it's God honoring. God may, watch this, put you in the court the environment or the circumstance of somebody that you do not like and might even say you despise them. It might be a work, man. You get moved in your department, you're now working under a new boss, and they have all the things that you don't like about your new boss or your coworkers. You get married and you love them, but you find out that you actually don't like their in-laws. Name the position or the court you've been in, and it might just be that God is the one that brought you there. To be a witness and to serve people. I want to read this quote by C.S. Lewis. Love is never wasted for its value, for it does not rest upon reciprocity. Meaning, even if somebody doesn't show you the same love in return... The fact that you showed them love, it's not wasted. What does it look like for you and I to love and serve those in our life that we absolutely despise or disagree with? It's actually in this moment, you and I must see that people are not the enemy. That we're used to this. You watch news, social media, the person comes up, and you get mad at them. I, listen, I know what you feel like. They are not the enemy. The enemy is the enemy. He has a name, and he has a following, and his name is Satan. And he has a dominion, and he has fallen angels and demons that are wreaking havoc. That is the enemy. Your family member is not the enemy. Your political opponent is not the enemy. The agenda that you see on Facebook that everyone's talking about is not the enemy. And when you and I actually start to have lenses to see people in light of Jesus through the lens that they were created in the image of God, it will change how you serve them. Because most of us get caught up in this. I would never. How dare they? You've lost the lens of the gospel. That Jesus came to serve those 
who were despicable. And when I actually see myself in that kind of lens as well, I then appreciate the grace that was given to me. Isn't this crazy? Like when I actually see that I am despicable in my sin, that I deserve hell, that I am wretched, that I'm a rebel at heart, and Jesus came for me, it changes in the way that I see people around me to go, they're not wretched, they're not scum, they're not despicable. Actually, the enemy has duped them, and I am going to love them. You talk about the mission of God? Listen, we can all day long here at Camino Chapel, we can build buildings, we can grow programs, we can, we can have all kinds of things and bring back stuff that was awesome in the 80s. Name the stuff that we can do around here. If we don't love people, it won't matter. And it's not just the pastor and the staff loving people. We, we have got to love people to say no matter how I see you or what has come up in my heart, I'm putting that aside to show you the love of God. You talk about a church that'll change a culture and an island and a Stanwood and a Camano Island, all that, you talk, loving people. Okay, let's keep going. The king said to me, why is your face sad? Seeing that you're not sick, this is nothing but sadness of the heart. And then I was very much afraid. So, Nehem, just a little moment, like, Nehemiah is going, oh no, he sees it. It's written all over my face. Because in those moments, you had to have the right words, the right language, the right countenance. Everything, everything had to be lined up. Now watch this. Nehemiah chooses to be bold in this situation. Verse 3, I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? Now this is a big deal. Because part of the prayer that Nehemiah prayed in chapter 1 was success upon the people who delight to honor God. I pray for success that you would move in the heart of the king. It is in this moment that Nehemiah is ready to answer because he has been prepared. Here's my question to you, Christ follower, in the midst of the people you're serving in your life. Are you prepared if in this situation the person you're serving were to ask you, what's wrong and what's going on? Why is your face so sad? Are you and I ready because we've been prepared in prayer? Meaning this, that I actually have something of gumption, conviction, my gut that would say, I know where I'm going with my life. I know what I'm asking for, that I'm ready because God has been moving in my will to know his will, to know his direction. This is this next kind of piece of this puzzle. Are you ready? Do you and I as Christ followers know where we're going? Now, I get it. Time out for a moment for you to go, well, I I want to be led by the Lord. Yes, absolutely. But it takes you and I in preparation of prayer to say, Lord, I've been laying this at your feet and laying this at your feet. I know that this is where you're calling me to. I'm ready so that at any moment, even the person that's not in your court, so to speak, would ask, what are you requesting, you would be ready to answer them. Do you know where you're headed? That you would be ready to say, okay. And I love this. I pray to the God of heaven. So for us, we read that and we think, okay, I just need to be ready in the moment to pray. Yes, absolutely. But what you and I often forget is what I've just been talking about. We're talking about months and months of preparation and prayer. So this is kind of like this. Nehemiah has been ready through prayer, but even in the moment he's being asked, he still says, okay, Lord, this is yours. And I've always wondered what he prayed, you know. Did he pray, Lord, I pray I'd honor you. Lord, I pray that you stir the heart of the king. 
Lord, would my words be right? I don't know. I don't know what Nehemiah prayed. But in that moment, even though he's been praying and praying and praying, even in this moment, he still goes, and he's praying with his mind. Oh, this is encouragement to you and I that in those moments that you know are kind of the watershed moment, the moment God has placed before you with that person, that you would go, and in your mind, Lord, this is your moment. I'm humbly before you. Whatever that prayer is, be in prayer. When your boss is around the corner and he asks you a big question that you've been praying for regarding something for a long time, maybe it's something in your family that you've been going, I need to have this conversation. I don't know how, this, how, how to have this conversation. God, would you lead me in this conversation? And the conversation presents itself and you pray. And watch what Nehemiah says. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. We talked about this last week and a couple of weeks ago, that there is something incredibly powerful in prayer when you and I are ready to engage and serve the prayer we ask. Because so often we're throwing up microwave prayers. We want it quick. We want it fast. We want it done. And so we do is go, God, please do this, but like, don't, don't include me with it, right? Don't, don't inconvenience me. I don't want to serve it. I just want you to do it. God, please do this, but like, <laughs> right? Just don't touch me, right? And Nehemiah says, and he's ready for the prayer that he's been praying, send me to Judah that I may rebuild the wall. Are you and I ready to serve the cause that we're praying for. It's one thing to say, hey, the wall needs to be rebuilt, but really, I don't know who's going to do it. It's another thing to step up to the plate to say, I'm ready and available. Let's go do it. And then this is what the king does. Actually, I love this. This is actually kind of neat. And the king said to me, and then it says, the queen sitting beside him, kind of like in brackets, which I kind of love, like, I don't know if they were making sure they knew that the wife was also in, in on this. Like, well, I believe, is that okay, honey? Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone when you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. He knew exactly what he wanted to do, what he wanted to do, and he had a time. He was specific. Church, are you and I becoming specific in our prayers to know where we're headed and what we're going to do? Because it might just be the person that we're serving would open up their hand, their pocketbook, or whatever resources to actually get you in on the cause. It's just, just mind-blowing. So here's what happens. The king signs all these letters. He's writing the right stamp on it. He's giving the approval. And Nehemiah gets to go get work done. It goes to verse 9. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letter. So Nehemiah is handing letters out, and now what they're doing is they're sending armies with him. I'm just, just for a moment, listen, church. You have no idea what God is working behind the scenes if you would just ask and be humble and be prepared in prayer. How often do we try to fix things on our own will, but it's actually God wanting to work something bigger and far better than our plans would ever imagine? So now Nehemiah has been sent with like armed guards back to Jerusalem to make sure his passageway is right. Now keep going with me. Verse 11. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. And then I arose in the night. I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one which I rode. Okay, so just think about this just for a moment. Nehemiah comes into town. It's dark. He hasn't told anybody. And he gets a few people with him. Now again, I told you, there's several little sermonettes of today's message. I equally think there is something so powerful about a person that has put their plan to the Lord for months and months and months 
and days, refining the plan, refining the focus, refining the vision. And that person says, I'm not going to broadcast to everybody to try to just get everyone on board. I'm going to bring along a few people. And they go into the city, they go look at the gates, they go look at everything. And I imagine that these men had to be the kind of people to tell Nehemiah the truth instead of just yes men. So they're looking at the gates and they go, hey, Nehemiah, I know, I know you want to work on this one first, but I, this one is not as important as getting this one done. I know that's not what you want to hear. They're not yes men. They're looking, they're observing They're inspecting. I think for you and I, as we're building the church, we're building our individual lives, we're building stuff in our culture, what God has placed in your gut and your soul where to go, it might mean one of the best things you can do instead of broadcasting all over social media what you're going to do might mean that you would actually get a few people in your court to say, I need need some people that aren't going to be my yes men. I need you to help me. And that you would come alongside individuals in your life that could be your rock solid group of men, or if you're a lady, a rock solid group of ladies. One of my biggest concerns for us as a church is how lonely and alone some people are. It it breaks my heart when we get a call from you on the care sheet to help out with something and you are not involved in any kind of community and not involved in any kind of salt group, not involved in any kind of Sunday school class and you are alone and lonely. That is miserable in my opinion that the church isn't come alongside of you but not the church at large but a few good people. And if you're one of those folks that says, I'm alone and lonely, pick up a phone. Come get involved. You need a few good people around you that can love you and serve you and help keep you on track. Why? Because often in our attempts at walking in Jesus, we do it the Lone Ranger style. Just go by myself. And so we're not involved in any kind of community, but it might actually be that as you are growing in your goal and what God has placed in front of you here at the church, what you're a part of, that the few people around you can help shape you. Because you are listening to the Lord in regards to what you're doing. I want to just finish this. So verse 13, I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. So this is where we kind of enter this interesting piece of this. Because I don't want to leave you with just this motivational message. That's not what church is. You don't come here just to get a motivational message. Everything we do is gospel-centered. So what are the implications of the gospel and this story? And as I read Nehemiah, I keep going back to the God of the universe who makes covenant with me to accomplish his massive goals and his will. I can't help but think that the first original goal that God had with himself, the Son, and the Holy Spirit was the plan of redemption. We see here God working through Nehemiah to build a wall, but it is God who has already been at work before the foundations of the world to save you and me. And he had a plan and he executed it. And it tells me in the word that before the foundations of the world, God has been at work in his plan to save mankind. And that he sent his son at just the right time. Just as God sent Nehemiah at the right time, so much more did God send his son in order for you and I to have grace in Christ by the cross. And Jesus executed the plan perfectly. And as Jesus was doing ministry here on earth, he had to be in complete connection with the Father, constantly going to him So that he would walk and step with the Father God. 
God gives you the plan as you pray, but guess what? He never gives you the plan so far that you can outplan the Lord. Like, it is perfect that God gives you pieces that you are staying connected with him through the pieces. That he never gives you the full plan so that you can go, thanks God, I'll see you in three months. No, he gives you the pieces so that you're walking in step with him. Now, some of you, he gives you longer pieces. I don't know why. He gives me short inches because I'm just, I'm a knucklehead. I need this. Okay, Lord, what else? Okay, what else? (laughs) And God never gets tired. So if you're an inches kind of person, glory be to God. But he's walking with you. God's plan to save mankind through his son Jesus involves grace to those who don't deserve it. Nehemiah serving a king who does not deserve it. And yet the king is in the sovereignty of God to work with Nehemiah. God may be putting you in the court of people that you despise and hate, but it might mean that you are opening their eyes to see the gospel of Jesus. This story goes full circle how you and I are willing to pray and be prepared and to execute the plan, seeing as that God already executed the plan through his son Jesus, that you and I would be a part of this plan. We're going to see continue Nehemiah of this plan unfolding. We're also going to see next week that you and I see some antagonists to the story and how you and I handle antagonists. God is rebuilding this nation. God is rebuilding his church. God is rebuilding in your lives. What he calls us to right now is to be prepared in prayer and that we would be available to execute the plan. I want to ask you to bow your heads as the team comes back up here to continue to sing over us. As you have your heads bowed, I I want to pray over you and ask the Lord to speak to you And every one of us is different. We're going through different things, different seasons. We're going through different people, circumstances, different jobs, different relationships. And wherever you're at, I know for certain that God uses his word to speak to you specifically. So it might mean that whatever it is that's going through your head right now in regards to this word, I pray you'd respond to it. So Lord God, would you please speak to us that we would respond to you, love you, repent, ask you for your guidance, that we would be servants. So Lord God, I pray you'd speak to us. In your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. Uh, Would you mind standing as we just continue to sing? And as always, we're up here at the front. It might mean for some of you, you need to come to the altar. We We haven't called that in a long time, but... It might mean that you may need to give some stuff up to the Lord. Let's continue to worship. Lord, make us servants in your house and consider others better than ourselves. Lord, make us humble. Make us
Lord God, I pray that uh, as we are growing, being rebuilt in your grace, as we have what you've put on our hearts to pursue your will and to go after what you've put in front of us, I pray that we would do just what the word says in this song to emulate our model Jesus, to be gentle, that we would be a witness to those around us to see your will accomplished, for people to know Jesus, to serve and love those that we disagree with, and to show them the love of Christ. It's in your wonderful name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. Awesome. I love you tremendously. Thank you for being here. Two things. One, we always have our prayer area if you need someone to pray with. And then number two, if you come to the 930 service, we always have our tent available out there. We love you guys. Have a great week. Be blessed.